A very good evening to you, I'm Lisa Lord, and in our headlines, optimism that tourism will be better off after COVID. Changes could be coming to the Barinda Cox fish market following yesterday's deadly freak accident. Fortunes described as mixed for city businesses since the shutdown. And in sports, three batsmen put up their hands for the Wendy's first test, 11. Newsnight headlines was brought to you, compliments Omega XL. Broadcasting from our studios in the Pine St. Michael, this is CBC Newsnight, starting now. And in our top story, Prime Minister Mia Amor Motley is optimistic that tourism in Barbados and the Caribbean will be better off post-COVID-19, given the lure of the region. She admits tourism numbers experienced in December and January will not be seen for some time, noting when travel resumes, it will be gradual. Ms. Motley was a guest on CNC3 television in Trinidad and Tobago, where the Caribbean's future was discussed. When people want to travel again, they're going to want to keep it simple and keep it vanilla almost so that um, the Caribbean with the sun, sea, surf, the relative safety, um, biosecure atmospheres, um, those things will matter to people. We're near shore for North America, reasonably still near shore for the UK. Um, and we want to open up new markets um, as to whether this will provide the opportunity. I don't know, we're gonna try. Um, countries like Ireland, countries like Spain, countries in Africa, um, in particular West Africa, that has not necessarily been badly hit yet. We have to look at these new markets. And then of course, um, when Latin America does settle down, um, there may be opportunities there. Well, structural changes could be coming to the Barinda Cox fish market to ensure the safety of vendors and patrons. This from Member of Parliament for Christchurch South, Ralph Thorne, in light of yesterday's tragic freak accident. The accident resulted in the death of 74-year-old fish vendor Rita Hunt and left 63-year-old Dorothy Hall nursing injuries. Mr. Thorne says barriers are safe. being considered. Minister, uh, Mr. Humphrey has... Uh, made a commitment, I believe, to uh, look at the question of barriers because where city sat, uh, it is somewhat exposed. Uh, the openness uh, lends uh, uh, an ambiance which is favorable, but at the same time, it also exposes uh, that area of the market to misadventure. And uh, we really would have to look at enclosing that area and indeed enclosing the full stretch of, of, the, of the marketplace. Mr. Thorne expressed his condolences to the family, friends and colleagues of Ms. Hunt, saying the market would not be the same without her. She is one of the stalwarts of the market. She is one of the people who brought the market from a primitive state into its modern state and uh, she cannot be replaced. She, she really cannot be replaced. She is one of the stalwarts. She is one of the builders of the market. She is one of the people who has uh, given the market a good reputation. She has fed the people of Oyster. She has fed the people of Barbados. And we will miss her. The market will not be the same uh, in Stacey's absence. And during a visit to the market this morning, Minister of Maritime Affairs and the Blue Economy, Kirk Humphrey, also expressed a sorrow at the passing of Ms. Hunt. He gave the assurance that his ministry would support the vendors during this difficult time. I must tell you, when I heard the news, it brought tears to my eyes, honestly, because I know, really now, I know most of you. And I, I just want to come with my personal sense of regret. Um, these tragedies, you know, you don't see them coming. I understand now that, is that we should look at getting some barriers between the, the car park and the vendor, where the vendors are, and that's something I promise that we will look into. Um, you know, you see these things after, unfortunately, these things occur. But I want to continue to offer, on behalf of the ministry, my fully support to Oysins and to all the vendors, really, in Barbados. 
The Congress of Trade Unions and Staff Associations of Barbados, or CITUSAB, is satisfied that the structure of the Barbados Optional Savings Scheme, or BOSS, program meets the expectations of the labor movement. General Secretary Dennis DePisa says the fact that participation in the scheme, which is voluntary, optional, and rests on what an individual public officer can afford to invest from the monthly salary represents a reasonable offer for consideration. CITUSAB credits the government for having fully engaged labor unions and the social partnership in consultation on the details of the proposed BOSS program. In moving to the implementation phase, the Congress anticipates that every effort will be made to ensure the efficient management of the scheme so as to eliminate the possibility of any public officer being disadvantaged as a consequence of your system or procedural failure. Even though officials have deemed it business as usual, establishments and entrepreneurs in the city are still seeing limited cash flows, and many of them have been forced to use different approaches such as sales to attract some shoppers. Rianne Phillips tells us more. It's been over a week since the majority of COVID-19 protocols were relaxed, allowing for a partial lifting of the curfew, longer opening hours for businesses, and an ease of restrictions on public transport. So far, some businesses have reported pockets of activity, but earnings are still down from pre-lockdown levels. For Sewing World, business has fluctuated across departments. Downstairs in the section where we have like the supermarket, um, we find that we are getting a, a kind of little steady flow there. Um, people are into still buying, you know, food, children are still home, so you're getting a lot of breakfast stuff from by us. Over in the fabric section where people are still getting um, fabric, pelon for the mass and the cotton, so we have a few fabric that is selling at this time for the mass. Upstairs only, you're getting a 19% discount on the household items, so you can capitalize on that. And vendors have been sharing mixed experiences. When I first came out, the first week, you know, was a little quiet, but then after it started to pick up, you know, people buying like hair and, you know, clips and, you know, sandals and so on, the creams and things, so it, it kind of picked up for me. So I won't complain. This is my first week back out. First week back out. But nobody ain't, ain't, ain't the money holding back. Nobody ain't spending the money right now. Things have lively ended up a bit due to the fact that the gates are open now and the hours are actually back to normal. Just closing an hour earlier. Now the amber fish is back with the sargasm once again. So the amber fish coming back in glut now. Right now they're like, the amber fish can sell like $5 a pound. So all the amber fish lovers, fresh amber fish back in the market. Many of these business people are hoping activity will pick up in the coming days and weeks. Rianne Phillips, CBC News. Health officials have had to be creative in implementing COVID-19 protocols in daycare centers. Deputy Chief Environmental Health Officer Ronald Chapman admits it was a challenge given the strategies used to fight the pandemic and the child-friendly environment. In terms of hand, what hand hygiene, respiratory hygiene, social distancing, wearing a mask, um, all these things are a little bit more difficult in daycare centers than you would imagine, as you could imagine, um, getting little children not to share toys, getting them to stay away from one another, getting them to wash their hands regularly and to not touch up one another and not hug and so on. That's almost an impossibility in a daycare center. So we had to come up with some pretty novel ideas in terms of how to get this done. And speaking on CBC TV 8's Morning Barbados, Mr. Chapman revealed some rules have been changed to be a bit stringent. For example, uh, sometimes you may have a parent who had a sick child. Uh, the, child the, the nursery may have called and said, well, hey, you know what, your child has a fever or maybe they, it looks as though the child isn't doing too well. Uh, could you come and pick up the child? And sometimes what they would have had issues where it took the parent uh, the whole day before they could come for the child. 
So we had to make sure mm -hmm. that we, we made those changes so that if your child is ill now, you, you, you need to come and collect it as soon as possible. Um, those, those changes, um, there were other changes where we decided that, that we would restrict, we would have to seriously restrict the entry of non-nursery personnel into the nursery. Well, as we creep towards a return to a state of normalcy, many questions are being asked about what measures will be put in place to aid in the island's COVID-19 recovery. In tonight's episode of Coping with COVID-19, we look at some recent proposals from the United Nations COVID-19 assessment for Barbados. <laughs> The UN Human and Economic Impact Assessment Report for Barbados has identified greater support for the informal sector and expanding social protection systems as two main recommendations for the island. The United Nations Development Programme, UNICEF and UN Women have conducted an analysis of the COVID-19 socio-economic state of the country to support the government's relief and recovery efforts, which it has described as, quote, best practice COVID response, unquote, in the Caribbean. So what exactly has the report outlined? One of the most attractive points is the provision of low-cost options for internet access to improve the ability of vulnerable groups to work on the net. With this, more underserved children will have equal access to online learning and SMEs the capacity to go digital. The report promotes the inclusion of informal workers into the formal economy via the National Insurance Scheme. Tourism's fall-off has been the elephant in the room for quite some time now, and while the report has acknowledged the difficult short-term outlook for the sector, it has highlighted that Barbados' informal sector contributes significantly, in fact, 30 to 40 percent to economic activity. It also notes that permanently including unemployment benefits for this group would reduce their vulnerability in times of uncertainty and could also rebuild the NIS through additional contributions. The assessment concludes that the government of Barbados has made significant strides in its crisis response and offers a range of fiscal, regulatory and social policy proposals aimed at accelerating post-COVID-19 recovery and mitigating the impacts on the country's socio-economic fabric. These are all proposals to help Barbados cope with COVID-19. <laughs> Barbados is part of a project aimed at managing responses to the influx of sargassum seaweed in the Eastern Caribbean. The three-year SARGADAP project, managed by the Center for Resource Management and Environmental Studies, focuses on converting this climate-linked ecosystem hazard into an asset that supports opportunities for socioeconomic development. Now, over $980,000 U.S. dollars in grant funding was provided to undertake the project here in Barbados since St. Lucia, Grenada, Dominica, and St. Vincent and the Grenadines. During a virtual media launch, project manager Anna Dejia says the program will be people-centered and will collaborate research. It will be implemented in three components. Component one focuses on the mobilization of knowledge. Component two, the development of capacity. And component three, on the institutionalization of the adaptation. Component one is about mobilizing knowledge, mobilizing knowledge and bringing it to stakeholders. In order to do this, we need to both better understand our stakeholders and we need to gather the information in order to bring it to them. She says controlling the influx will be beneficial. When it is stranded on our shorelines in large quantities, it has negative impacts on other ecosystems. By better managing the influxes, we mitigate the impacts on our coastal ecosystems and pr protect the ecosystem services they provide. By seeking to convert the hazard to an asset, we look at how we can obtain ecosystem services from the sargassum itself. 
Barbadians who are desirous of working for international organizations need to advance their studies beyond the undergraduate level. This advice from Barbados Ambassador and Permanent Representative to the United Nations, Elizabeth Thompson. A number of Barbadian young people approach me and say, I'm interested in working in the UN. Invariably, two things act as a barrier. They come only with a first degree. If you are serious about working at the international level, I want to say to our young people, a first degree is not going to do it. You have to have at least one master's, maybe two, because everybody with whom you work and sit at, in the table, at the table in the United Nations at a certain level has a PhD. Some people have two. While Ambassador Thompson also wishes to see more Barbadians at international organizations, she says interested persons should learn a foreign language. Very often you see it where the jobs are advertised and they ask you to have a minimum of three language skills, French, Spanish and English. They might ask for Portuguese, they may ask for Japanese or Chinese or Korean or something else. But you are going to have to come with some basic understanding and facility with more than one language. Well, far too often, fathers across the island go unrecognized. But even though Father's Day has passed, the Men's Empowerment Network support has decided to honor five Barbadian males as outstanding. Rian Phillips tells us more. The five outstanding dads honored by the Men's Empowerment Network support are men's. All hail from different segments of society. They are CBC's Shane Jones, Corey Worrell, Corey Lane, Patrick Ford and Richard Stolt. From all the awards that I would receive throughout my life so far, this is the one that makes me the most proud because this role is the one that I, is most important for me. And I think that men's is doing an absolutely fantastic job in not only promoting and helping and, and, and offering services to fathers and men, but also uh, to keeping men in check. I've received awards um, before and I think this is up there with my national award 13 years ago. This is the most important award I've ever received. Why? Because being a father is the most important job I've ever had and one that I cherish. So I would do the same in cherishing this award. I will not only present myself, but also represent the person with disability. And I really appreciate that I can be able to be out there to share person with disability that we can still be made out there outstanding. It is a pleasure to, to receive such a, uh, an outstanding award and, and to be remembered as a father. This is my third award uh, from, father, from a Father's Day organization. So it tells me that I must be doing something right. <laughs> and President of Men's Fabian Sargent says the presentation was designed to highlight the positive deeds of males. We wanted to come together to not only um, acknowledge men, but celebrate men. We believe that in this society, we speak too much towards the negative. We wanted to really highlight those positive fathers, those fathers out there who can be role models or those individuals who can act as role models for other fathers or other young men coming up. You know, So this was part of our Father's Day celebration as we celebrated not only the day, but the month. This is the first group of dads to be honored by men's which was established under a year ago. Rianne Phillips. Tip of the day is brought to you by Cooperators General Insurance Company Limited. Insurance the way you want it to be. Did you know in exchange for a premium, an insurance company agrees to indemnify an insured for specific types of loss as defined by an insurance policy? Cooperators General Insurance ensuring you are protected during this hurricane season. Regional stories now. Barbados Prime Minister and CARICOM Chair Mia Amor Motley is not pleased with the report submitted by the Chief Elections Officer to the Guyana Elections Commission. Ms. Motley decried attempts to declare the election after the Chief Elections Officer removed over 115,000 votes from the People's Progressive Party Civics tally on the grounds that they were fraudulent. Despite the ruling of the Court of Appeal that only valid votes should be used to declare the results, Ms. Motley contends the CARICOM observer mission has certified the recount as a valid. We must ask on what grounds and by what form of executive fiat does the chief elections officer 
determined that he should invalidate one vote, far less over 115,000 votes when the votes were already certified as valid by the officers of the Guyana Elections Commission in the presence of the said political parties. We must remind all that if there is any evidence of fraudulent or improper conduct, then there is a clear and well-accepted route to deal with these matters. It is through an election petition to an election court. Ms. Motley says CARICOM holds the strong view that no voter should, must be disenfranchised in determining the credibility of this or any election. It is this commitment to a fair and transparent political process that led CARICOM to send two electoral observation missions, one for the elections and one for the recount. In addition, four prime ministers accompanied me to talk to both sides and to urge patience, especially after the loss of one life. We thank you, the Guyanese people, for that patience. As you await the finalization of this process, we urge again that you be patient and that you be committed to the fact that no electoral process can replace the life of any Guyanese, or anyone for that matter. There must be room for all, regardless of who wins and who loses. Well, Trinidad and Tobago's Ministry of Community Development, Culture and the Arts says no final decision has been taken by the government on hosting Carnival 2021. The minister says the decision to host Carnival next year will be based on many factors. TTT reports. The government has not made a final decision on the hosting of Carnival 2021. There is no, we are in a holding stage. So there is no intention to cancel, but there is no intention to implement it. This from Minister of Culture, Dr. Nian Gantz Bidoli, who said Trinidad and Tobago's decision to host Carnival 2021 will be based on many factors, the critical one being the trajectory of the COVID-19 pandemic, both locally, regionally and internationally. However, she said band leaders and producers are making plans with respect to alternatives if there is to be a carnival. We are aware that local entrepreneurs, cultural entrepreneurs who operate in the carnival season are making plans for any eventuality, whether the carnival is held and it is a local carnival, or whether it is held and it's regional, or whether it is held and it's international. The culture minister said band leaders and producers are also prepared to take the financial risk if there are to be any changes to carnival celebrations next year. Well, given the grim projection for tourism in the Bahamas post-COVID-19, tourism stakeholders are shifting their focus from tourists to locals. Several major hotels remain closed until the fall, and COVID-19 restrictions are in place for returning Bahamians and visitors. Our news reports. For months, Junkanoo Beach, just like Bay Street in Paradise Island, has been a ghost town. And with hotels like Bahamar and Sandals remaining closed until fall, many who work within the tourism industry are concerned about the effect it will have on their business. Byron Austin, owner of Tiki Bikini Hut, is preparing to reopen on Monday. Though borders reopen to commercial flights next week, he will depend heavily on the local dollar. We're going to have to come up with other uh, ways and means to um, create revenue. So for me, I'm going to focus mostly on the local market and see how we can wow them. Well, basically what we did was we created like safe spaces. So we created these four cabanas. We're going to uh, have a maximum of five persons in each cabana. Also, we have other spaces that we we're going to utilize on the beach. Beaches reopen on Monday, but restrictions are not welcome news to some visitors with already planned trips as seen in the comment section of a Ministry of Tourism Instagram post. One tourist wrote, requiring a negative COVID test result means we will be canceling our July 3rd to 6th trip across Tavimini. 16 people staying home. Another wrote, might have to reevaluate our August trip, to which the Ministry of Tourism responded, thinking about coming earlier, but the potential guest wasn't having it, saying, canceling our August trip. Another found the requirement of mask wearing funny, saying, masks on vacation in the Bahamas? LOL, no. But with a reduced number of visitors coming to our shores, establishments like Blue Lagoon, known for its day away beach and water activities, are focused on locals, offering special discounts. The attraction is now set to reopen on July 11th. In Jamaica now, criminal charges against George Williams, a mentally ill man who spent 
50 years in prison without a trial have been dropped. The charges were dropped yesterday when Williams appeared in the St. Catherine Parish Court. TVJ reports. The historic moment was captured by many ordinary Jamaicans who waited eagerly to put a face to the name. Sadly enough, many will remember him with the black eye he had after he was beaten a week ago by a fellow inmate in the St. Catherine Adult Correctional Center in Spanish Town. Despite that, his family was all too happy to start the process of catching up on the many decades they've missed out with him. We're just going to have fun. First, we're going to take him to the church, you know, let him know the do's and the don'ts. We're just going to try and make up life so quickly with him, make him live back his childhood days, his manhood days, you know. We're just going to be there for him. We're going to love him. We're going to treat him right. We're just going to do the best for the little life that he has left out here with us. Well, I'm looking forward for the next uh, the, uh, the period of years left because he is the first. He will be the oldest of eight now. The oldest one has died, Thank so he'll be the oldest of eight. This is the house in Ivy District in St. Catherine, where Mr. Williams will settle after leaving prison. But after leaving the courthouse today, the family journeyed to Linstead for some catching up with people who were never born when Mr. Williams went to prison. His niece is one of those persons. Her husband is meeting Mr. Williams for the very first time. Uncle George. This is my husband, no, 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 no. Nigel Green. Yes. So you'll notice from now until all of us are going to take care of you.